More than a year ago, Jack Collis and Toyota were telling anyone who would listen that there were alternatives to this thing called an EV. Of course, EVs would play a role, and so would other propulsion systems. But that was the point. One size didn't have to fit all. And Jack Collis, I'll tell you, is not here to take a victory lap, but he probably could. So to close out our day, please welcome Toyota's lead cheerleader and a heck of a nice guy, Jack Hollis. All these folks today, all they talked about are all these propulsion systems they have. <laughs> you believe that? Well, it's, uh, first of all, hello everyone. <laughs> Hope you've had a good day. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's interesting because a year ago, uh, I think in this room, there was all the talk about everybody, all the OEMs were all in on EV. And then by 2026, there was going to be you know, 60 or 80 or 100 percent. And, and uh, I'm interesting to see a year later how everyone's now talking a lot about bringing back hybrids and plug-in hybrids. And it's, it's interesting to see how um, it has changed. And except for us. And our, our, our issue is it wasn't because it's smarter or not, it's the same easy strategy is find out what our dealers, we got a lot of them in the room, both Lexus and Toyota, just find out, ask the dealer, what is it that you want? What is the customer wants? And give it to you. And the same answer last year, the same answer this year is they want a mixture of options for the customer. And that's, it's simple. And I'm excited about that. And I'm excited to see the rest of the OEMs seeing that same thing. It just talks about that the customer's right. It, it was, it was definitely a heavy theme. I'll tell you that uh, is in some way, I, I know, I know you're not going to say yes, but do you feel a little vindicated? <laughs> I know you won't say yes. <laughs> I will say this. It, it, it feels really good to know that our dealers and the communication we have with our dealers is accurate. And that is, is that we have to, and if we continue to listen to the dealers, it will be the right answer. So it's not about vindication at all. It's about staying consistent with our own strategy, and that is to always listen to our dealers. Uh, let's talk about the government regulations that, you know, again, obviously the announcement six days ago. Uh, do you think the government regulations were or are pushing too quickly? Y well, yes. Uh, y yes, before last week and right. yes, now. Um, and it's, it's not that the regulations, are, I don't think, are necessarily taking into consideration what the marketplace is saying. And, and, and that's always a dangerous place to be. It's, do we need EVs? Yes. But why? What's, what's the reasoning? And I'm still going to come back, is what's the main question? And the and main question, at least at Toyota and Lexus, that we're trying to answer is, how do we reduce carbon as fast as possible, everywhere as possible, by everyone to participate? That's it. And the EPA regulations don't seem to match that. It's more telling you what you must do or what you have to buy versus asking the customer what is best for them. And that's a, that's a dangerous position to be in. And I think that's why there's, even where it is now, it's still too soon. See, if you stretch it out a little bit further, 2035, 2040, probably 2040 really, is you can have a consistent approach where the customer can come along with you for the journey. And I think that would make the marketplace work and, and, and also make it more uh, profitable for both the OEMs and the dealers. But we're sitting here and a couple of years ago, um, you know, what was written in the headlines and, Toyota's behind and, you know, all of these things because the consumer was just going to come along. Yeah. Yeah. And the consumer, for a variety of reasons, whether it was affordability, which we've talked about here today, um, you know, pricing or infrastructure or, you know, whatever the reason was, the consumer hasn't followed. So being behind wasn't really part of the equation, was it? Well, I, guess, I guess the question is, is what's behind what's what? What's behind? Yeah, what was, how would anybody determine if you're behind? Yeah, you because didn't, we didn't go out and say stuff? You didn't stake your claim. Part of it, you can think back, before the EV was cool, Toyota had our RAV4 before any of the other products, right? We were teaming up. We actually had other partnerships with Tesla and other uh, makes on EVs before it was cool. We've always been the environmental conscious company the, to put the environment at the for, forefront. That's why Prius, I mean, I don't know how many of you are here, but if you look back when we started Prius, most the whole industry made fun of us to bring out a hybrid. Now they're making fun of, fun of us for having a hybrid. You know, you, you can't win. But the actual, is we're, the actuality, all we're trying to do is continue to think about the environment, but with the customer mindset first. I said this morning that 
a bunch of teenagers have the Prius on their wall at home. That's yeah. how cool it is. <laughs> Prius, we can't, we can't make enough. I mean, we're, so the, demand, the demand is so much uh, uh, higher than the supply right now, we're still under a five-day supply of Prius nation, nationwide. Five-day. I mean, that's just what it is. Right. So we know we're in the right place, and the, and the hybrid demand continues to grow faster than any part of the business. So what are you telling your Toyota dealers about EVs, then? Do we need them? But we need them as, an, as a option, not the option. I'm mean, sorry, a answer, not the answer. I think that's part of it. We, EVs are going to play a, a, a strategic role in this whole industry. And especially in a place like in New York, there's a lot of reasons for it. But there's a lot of, across the entire country, how do you match it? Or how about globally? It's not, this is not a U.S. question, right? Because if right. you clean up the air in the U.S. and don't do it anywhere else, it doesn't make any difference. You have to do it globally. So what's the global answer? And the global answer is you have to have options that everyone can participate in. And eight months from now, the, uh, the, the goalposts may change anyway. Yeah. How, how would a change in the administration affect your product plans? Well, quite honestly, they probably won't change much at all. Um, and I say that sincerely. Our plans are made regardless of who's the president, what administration's in. Ours, it's a long-term approach back with our dealers and our customers. And I'm going to keep going back to that. That's been the strategy forever. Doesn't matter if it's Democrat or Republican. Our plans are long-term. Our long-term investments, like in North Carolina, that's a $17 billion investment just in batteries. Why? We're going to need them. And the issue is we're going to stay consistent with that, regardless of who's in office. And the regulations kind of keep going all over the place. And if we kept moving all over the place, we would be so screwed up. So it doesn't change our product portfolio. It just changes, literally, the, the regulations and the timelines to get to where we're going to end up going anyways. Let's talk about agility and premium versus mass market for customers, how much of an advantage is it to have two separate brands, and how do you how do you stay agile? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's phenomenal to have two brands, and I start to miss our third brand. I miss I miss our days of Scion because I think there's an element there that still was so much fun about having multiple brands because it's a way to listen better. Having having two channels and having a luxury and a and a and a, and a, a mainstream is awesome because you get to hear directly from the entire industry which is why our lineup and our portfolio from sedans to SUVs, trucks, and everything in between is, is maximized because we can deliver what the customer wants. And so the two channels are great. Both brands are at the top of their game. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, especially from an NADA crowd, we are very proud of the relationship with our dealers in the sense, or proven by the number one and number two rankings uh, in, in the dealer attitude survey. That attitude and that dealer relationship is number one, and that's, I appreciate NADA for sure for both having me, but to, 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 to know that relationship and how we compete because of the dealers is important. Are BEVs changing the expectations of your luxury buyers? Are BEVs changing? I think from the Lexus side and from the Lexus dealer feedback is don't move too quick. Take your time. You've created the right strategy. Stay with it. Because most of our Lexus owners have, or Lexus dealers, have other franchises. And they're seeing the struggles they have of 100 and 200 and 300 day supply of their EVs. So where we're at right now, the expectations, I don't know if they're necessarily changing, but they're asking, hey, be, stay strategic. Don't rush. Do the right thing. And that's what we intend to do. Uh, speaking of 200, 300 day supply, I mean, on that point, there are many dealers in this room who look at their fleet, maybe it's not Toyota or Lexus, mm. but they say, well, you know, we can't move these vehicles off the lot. Yeah. What's your attitude about that? I mean, <laughs> I know. <you> <laughs> My attitude is, I feel bad. Like, I, like, I, like it, I, it, I don't care what brand you are, any dealer who's carrying excess inventory for me is, um, it's disappointing. It's saying that the marketplace isn't there. Everyone makes great products, but when there's too many of them, it's saying something about the segment or some, saying something about the marketplace. The marketplace isn't demanding the amount of supply that's there. It's a very simple economics game. And when that happens, I feel a little disappointed for any of you dealers who have that situation, because I'd never want to put our dealers in a situation where they have to, have to say no to a product. It's not, it's not good, it's not healthy, it hurts relationships. It needs to be about listening to that demand and delivering it. And I think in some of those brands, um, people's ideas and ideology got ahead of the reality. 
Let's talk about some dealer issues or retail issues. We'll start with the, the sale of some stores that occurred over the course of the last six to 12 months that are uh, astronomical, atmospheric. Does it even surprise you the amount of money that some dealers are getting for their Toyota Lexus stores? Yeah, but you know what? Y yes, I, I, I have to admit, it's surprise, surprising to see some of the numbers. But then when I see the commitment of that dealer body to understand as we get together, we are not just talking about uh, you know, team and fa family. I mean, it's one organization, we're moving together. And so what it does, and, I, and here's where the hard part comes in, and this is as sincere as I can be, it puts pressure on us because we have to continue to deliver. We know we must deliver on, if your person's gonna pay 10 times their earnings, and that they're expecting us to stay really consistent and can keep delivering on that. That's a lot of pressure on the OEM. But we want that for our dealers because they've earned that right. It's also why we've kept our dealer count down. We want the throughput to be very, very high. Yeah. And that's one of the best metrics we have is being number one in throughput. How many units can we put through every dealership? Because we can always grow and put more open points and stuff, but we don't. That's not our MO. We, we, it's rare. And I think that's what's really important is to understand is that we want to keep feeding the success of the dealers because we're only going to win if our dealers win. That's it's as simple as that. Yeah, you've added in what one open or two open points in the last five years or something. Yeah, I, I don't have the math with me. I know one of the guys on my team here has it, but I, I think we've had one in the last five years and two in the last eight. Right. I might be off by a little. Not bit. exactly handing them out. No, it, it, it's just it's very very slow. And I think that's um, um it's the right long term strategy, and we're always thinking about it the long term. Uh, we talked with uh, Mr. Munoz about his Amazon Pilot project and the retail model. Are you ever going to move to an online Amazon model? No. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I don't think I heard that again. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> no, I will tell you this. Um, that's an interesting move. Um, I think that's not Why for is us. That interesting? I, I think that anything that um, goes into a situation where the dealers may not be the primary source. I know that there's a discussion still, and I, many of Hyundai dealers, I would love to understand more from the dealer point of view what, what you believe in it. Um, I think it's very dangerous to get outside of the network of the dealers. Now, on the opposite side, the online purchase to making purchasing easier, to making it more seamless, that is not only are we committed to, but through our Smart Path investment and our monogram on Lexus, our Smart Path for Toyota monogram on Lexus, is we have worked with our dealer body to actually ask them to help us create the system that they want to use. That's a big, it's a, it's a, it's a completely divergent approach. And for us is to take what the dealer's input is and then provide it so that they have a tool to make it seamless for you, the customer. That to me, we are all in on. You wanna talk about all in? We are all in on that. But that it's, it's in alignment directly with all of the DMS systems, all the, all the cybersecurity needed, all of the, uh, the protection of privacy for the customer and the dealer, and that to me is where we're, we're all in. So are we all in on making it easier for the customer? Seamless and quick and any way they want it to be served up like an option? Yes. Are we looking at the other option? I, I would say no. Well, you're all in on technology is what I hear. Right? Have to be. Right? Digital retailing. Have to be. And it's not, and in, 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 in anymore, um, I used to always say digital retailing. I don't even say it anymore. It's just retailing. It's just retailing. And, and everybody who's not there with a stronger digital approach, and we're only, we're only great now. We need to be great er. And, and that's that's part of the philosophy. We started with something with our dealers and we need to take what we've done already and make it better. And that's what we're, we are committed to doing. A couple other subjects, affordability, uh, ATPs escalating, obviously. How do you keep cars accessible to a greater number of people? Man, it, Jason, that's a, it, it's so tough right now. If you look at, if you consider between interest rates, the, the inflationary uh, pressures that have been there, raw materials costs, labor costs, costs are going at a are growing at a significant rate. So how do you keep that? We've talked about it once or twice before. Um, we're real close to that fifty thousand dollar mark. Fifty thousand dollars. And how many vehicles are even being sold below at twenty thousand dollars? Basically none on a new vehicle. So I it, it, it's it. It's very, very difficult. It's one of the reasons why I think the approach that Toyota and Lexus that we have, we have um, 
stay committed to is a full lineup, including sedans, mm -hmm. SUVs at all levels and sizes, and trucks, all the way across for the Toyota and Lexus lineup. We have to find ways and options for every kind of consumer with every kind of budget. It's also why we expanded even our, our CPO program. We had a gold program, we wanted, to, we wanted to expand it. And now the silver program, longer in the life, more miles on that vehicle. And I think it's important that we have to reach these customers who don't have $50,000. And, and it's, um, I think it's a big challenge for the entire industry. Uh, finance companies, dealers, it's, it's a very, and even used car auctions and used car, it's a very difficult situation right now, and I don't, I don't see a short-term solution on this. Yeah, there's some dealers who've coined it as a affordability crisis. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you have announced you're expanding that CPO program, as you said. Does your product mix give you more pricing flexibility? Yeah. I'm guessing it does. It does. And I, I look at how many vehicles we still have under 30,000. And you look at you know, vehicles like Corolla and Corolla Cross and SUV, and you have a Prius. And you, you look at, we continue. It's just funny. I was just thinking about this. Just if I asked the whole dealer body here, non-Toyota, uh, what product is one in the hottest in demand by our dealers right now? You know, you might say, you know, the truck portfolio or it's one of them is Corolla. And they well, Corolla, well, why? Because so many customers are wanting a great vehicle at an, at, at an entry, it's not even entry anymore, at an entry or more of an entry level. So we have this extreme demand for Corolla that's coming through. This is additive to the rest of the lineup right now because as prices are going up, people are needing to find an affordable price on a new vehicle. You're putting a lot of marketing money toward that. We too, are, aren't you? we are. I see the Corolla advertisements. Corolla, all. Corolla Cross are as hot as they can be. Right. What's interesting though is interesting is how, how hybrid plays into that. Because if you look at it across the day supply for all of Toyota and Lexus, all of our hybrids, across at Lexus it's 10 days or less supply of a hybrid vehicle, and at Toyota it's five days or less. That's across the nation. I don't know exactly every single market, but across the nation, those are our hybrids. That again is telling you something of what people are asking for. So they're willing to pay to participate in, uh, you know, kind of an environmental piece, but they still want an affordable price. That's why hybrids are continuing to be even more actively pursued. Bob Carter has sat in this seat um, in prior years and talked about inventory levels and the optimum inventory level. Where do you think you've settled from a Toyota uh, brand perspective? What's the right day supply? Yeah. He used to talk about 30. Yeah. Bob who? <laughs> <laughs> I was just with Bob on Sunday, so I can, I can give him that. You guys can tell him that, by the way. Um, in fact, Bob and I talked about it on Sunday. We went down to the NASCAR race and had a great chat about some of the things. I don't think there's a day supply, and I don't want to get caught up in a day supply discussion. What I, it is, is I want to see the demand or the wholesale equaling retail and keeping a very flat line. I'm more about keeping a flat line to that than having ups and downs and having um, different, different needs for incentives. I want to keep it very consistent. And I think what our dealer feedback has been, both from the Lexus Dealer Council and National Dealer Council is, let's not focus on a day supply number or an inventory number, but balancing those so that we see inventories just not really growing or decreasing. And that's, that's really the goal. And right now we haven't reached it um, on, the, on the Lexus side, it's probably at that cruising altitude right now. And at Toyota side, we're still haven't, uh, we really haven't grown uh, much inventory still for uh, a couple of years. At the NADA show uh, back in Vegas, there a lot of talk of uh, BYD and Chinese vehicles. What's Toyota's stance on increased tariffs on Chinese vehicles coming into the US? Well, in the U.S. or anywhere, I think one of the things is <laughs> there's, a, there's an influence of China into the marketplaces globally. Toyota competes globally, and there's different tariffs across. So I don't want to get into so much about what it should be in the U.S. versus where it should be other places, because everyone needs to learn to compete on a global level. However, if, you, if we find, which has been reported the last couple of days, you've seen it across Europe and you've seen different places, if there is an unfair advantage or if there is something of cheating going on where subsidies are occurring by a government to help offset it, now you have to have a different discussion. I think until we really know what the details are of that, I don't really uh, try to make a comment. I will say this, I do think it's important to continue to build and source where you uh, sell your vehicles, and that's what I'm proud of Toyota for doing and continuously investing back into the U.S., producing in the U.S. or North America, because even North America as partners has a lot of 
value for both Canadian, Mexico, and Puerto Rico markets to work as one. This isn't directly aimed at a Chinese question, but you look around now, and um, how many years have you been at Toyota? 30, 32. 32. 32. The number of startups yeah. that are on the road now, yeah. not even the one that starts, I, yeah. Tesla's not a startup. Fine. Okay? Yeah. All right. Um, but the others yeah. that are here, and the ones that are coming. Yeah. It's a very different landscape yeah. than what you first encountered 32 yeah. years ago. Yeah. What does that do to Toyota? I mean, Toyota was a startup. Sure. At, uh, one, it confirms that what the strategy we took in, the long-term approach. Remember, if you go back to some of the quotes when the Toyota family came to the U.S., it wasn't about anything but a 50-year minimum commitment. Think about that. Just that. Minimum, if you just start with that, most of the startups are right now where there's a struggle is most of them are into right now right. and how much money they can make right now. And I understand that, you need capital, I get it. But with a short-term approach, it's very difficult to compete in this market. Secondly, all the startups, I think it's great because what it makes everybody do who's established is you gotta be better at your game. That's what I think where Toyota is, is we love the challenge. I don't care if it's Tesla or BYD or whoever, and I think BYD is the strongest of all of them. It makes us better. So that's why with tariffs, or things, I don't like getting into what the rules are. I wanna just, what does the customer want globally and who's the best at providing it? And that's where we're, that's, that's where we're gonna go. I do think, uh, the other thing though is, we, we learn how hard it is as a startup and how, how, how committed you have to be to the US consumer. Every one of these startups who doesn't go with a dealer model is putting themselves on a sh even a shorter leash, which I think is gonna lead to most of them not surviving. Well, you must sit back and laugh when you see the change that's occurred. We're gonna enter the market without dealers. We're gonna enter the market with dealers. But you understand the reason. They're saying, oh, if I don't have to spend, I have an extra margin to have a dealer, then I can actually make the money sooner. Again, sure. back to short term. Sure. If you wanna learn long term, you commit to your dealers. You, you commit to how successful they can be makes you successful. See, that's, that's why I, 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 I just think the whole industry is it's a lot simpler than everybody wants to make it. Make the dealers as successful as they can be and everything else works out right. Yeah, final thing. Jack will be, Jack will be signing autographs uh, after <laughs> No, no, it's... Signing baseballs. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, somebody said to me out in the hallway, you gotta ask him the really tough questions. Okay. And I, and I said, well, Toyota doesn't do anything wrong. So, what so what's, what's a tough question for Toyota? I don't know. Uh, we do plenty of things wrong. I think one of the things that, I don't know that question. I don't know how to answer it. I would say this, the one thing that um, we probably uh, can always move faster than we do. We, you know, the old expression of, you know, measure twice, cut once. You know, Toyota is, is really renowned for, and I'm actually this way as a person, and I, so I probably love it and I'm biased in, but it, it's okay to measure five times before we cut. I think sometimes it could possibly frustrate others, maybe in the industry, um, different members of different, even some of our dealers, I think sometimes I, some, can sometimes get frustrated um, with us on that. But I think there's an element that says, back to the long-term approach, we're going, we want to be successful for 50 years. So we're okay to take our time sometimes to make a decision that we think is best for the whole family. And if there's anything I would say is, I don't know if there's a tough question, I think any question is a fair question, but the toughest one is sometimes couldn't we move faster? And the answer is yeah. And I think there's some elements that we're working on right now to do so. Technologies and multimedia and, and, and different things like this. These are things that we probably should be moving a little quicker on a technology. Um, and I think that's what you're gonna see some of the next steps in our organization's growth will come from there. Well, when they took a California guy out of California and put him in Texas, they put a 100-year vision <laughs> into the headquarters in Plano. So I think the, the road is a long one for Toyota. It is, and I, I will tell you, Texas is a great place to be. It's a fantastic place for business. If you're looking for a place to go, it is a fantastic place. Yeah, it's always a pleasure sitting with you. Thank you so much. Well. Thank you. Jack Hollis. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jason.